This is a presentation on the nasal palatine duxus created by A.J. Jacobson, Blake Hansen, Jason Jerka, Michael Correa, and Nathan Free. In this presentation, we will discuss some standard background information about the nasal palatine duxus, its occurrence, predilection, etiology, and the histology. We will then go into the clinical and radiographic features of these lesions. Next, we will discuss some of the differential interpretations involved with the nasal palatine duxus. And lastly, we will describe the treatment options associated with the nasal palatine duxus. And with that, let's begin. The nasal palatine duxus is the most common epithelial and non-odontogenic cysts of the maxilla and occurs in about 1% of the general population. They occur at any age, although most are commonly reported between the ages of 30 and 50, with an average age being about 47 years. The nasal palatine canal cyst shows no ethnic predilection and are typically asymptomatic and discovered incidentally during routine oral or radiographic examination. Though symptomatic cases involving fluctuant swelling and draining are not uncommon. On the right side of the screen is an occlusal radiograph showing a large nasal palatine canal cyst. Notice the midline location. It is well circumscribed radiopaque border and radiolucent appearance, all of which are characteristic of the nasal palatine canal cyst. Finally, its large size has resulted in distal displacement of number 8 and number 9 tooth roots. The etiology of these cysts is straightforward. They arise from epithelial remnants found within the nasal palatine canal system, once stimulated, usually by irritation, infection, or trauma, a cystic cavity forms. Histology is commonly used in pathological differentiation by examining cell types and tissue structure. The cystic cavity lining is usually composed of stratified squamous epithelium, pseudostratified columnar epithelium, or both. The image on the right is an excised nasopalatine canal cyst measuring about 2.5 centimeters. These cysts are generally found during routine radiographic examination because it is typically an asymptomatic phenomenon. However, some pain, swelling, and drainage of the anterior palate have been reported but this is most often due to an infection of a previously asymptomatic nasal palatine duct. The surrounding dentition, teeth 7, 8, 9, and 10, are vital and the definitive diagnosis of the nasal palatine duct cyst is based on radiographic, histological, and clinical findings. The figure on the right of the slide depicts a clinical presentation of swelling in the anterior palate due to a nasal palatine duct cyst. This particular lesion is causing displacement of teeth eight and nine. Clinical findings may not be the most definitive means of diagnosing a nasal palatine duct cyst, but there are some characteristic radiographic features that help in the diagnosis of an NDC. The NDC itself can take the shape of an oval, circle, or can even be heart-shaped like the radiolucency shown on the pantomograph below. You can also see below that the nasal palatine duxus can cause root displacement. It may also cause displacement of other surrounding structures. However, it rarely causes root resorption. The size of the lesion radiographically is important in terms of the definitive diagnosis. A normal nasal palatine duct ranges from 1.5 4 millimeters to 5.9 millimeters. Therefore, a radiolucency between the maxillary central incisors measuring less than 6 millimeters is considered a normal, non pathological nasal palatine duct, whereas a radiolucent lesion measuring greater than 6 millimeters between the maxillary central incisors should be investigated further 
and a nasal palatine duct cyst should be included in a differential diagnosis. This figure is an axial section of a CT scan, and as you can see, a round, well-defined radiolucency at the anterior maxilla, which is towards the top of the picture. The image on the right demonstrates the location of the lesion, which is posterior to the maxillary incisors. Now that we've discussed the radiographic features of the nasal palatine duct cyst, it is important to establish a differential diagnosis when talking about any lesion. Differential diagnoses for the nasal palatine duct cyst should include a large nasal palatine foramen, radicular cyst, and nasal labial cyst. Other considerations to aid in the definitive diagnosis of these lesions should include radiographic examination, such as two-dimensional radiographs or a CBCT. Some other key questions to address is if the lesion is near an endodontic or periodontally involved tooth, or is the tooth responsive to percussion or palpation tests? These questions should be considered in order to properly treat these lesions. The importance of a correct diagnosis is evident by the picture presented to the right, which shows an intraoral photo of a nasal palatine duct cyst being removed after a flap was done in the anterior palate. A large nasal palatine foramen of non-pathological origin is a differential diagnosis that must be considered for nasal palatine canal cysts. On average, incisive foramina measure about 3.4 millimeters to 4.6 millimeters with ranges from 1.4 to 5.9 millimeters being generally accepted. Literature reports an incisive foramen greater than six millimeters as an enlarged and 10 millimeters or greater as indicating a strong pathological predilection. Incisive canals are typically smaller in diameter than incisive foramen and average about 2.7 millimeters in the anterior posterior direction and vary plus or minus one millimeter depending on where the measurement was taken within the canal system. If you look at the CBCT radiograph on the right, Note the four different non-pathological bony morphologies of the nasal palatine canal system. Another differential diagnosis is the radicular cyst. These are considered odontogenic cysts and develop as a result of an infection or trauma, which stimulates a proliferation of the epithelial cell rests of malaise. Radicular cysts usually present on a radiograph as a well-defined radiolucency near the apex of the involved teeth. Other radiographic characteristics include a lack of lamina dura, as well as a widened PDL space in the affected teeth. They are clinically associated with non-vital or necrotic teeth that typically present themselves as asymptomatic. However, swelling, tenderness or tooth mobility may also be seen. The image included is an occlusal radiograph of the anterior axillary teeth and is an example of a large radicular cyst above tooth number eight, which also happens to be endodontically treated. A third differential to consider is a nas nasolabial cyst. This non-odontogenic lesion originates from epithelium found in the anterior inferior portion of the nasal lacrimal duct and descends to finish development between the facial vestibule and the upper lip. These lesions usually present clinically as painless swellings and depending on the size of the lesion can cause nasal obstruction, which may cause respiratory difficulties for the patient. As it is a soft tissue lesion, traditional radiographs will be of little value as diagnostic tools. Instead, methods such as CT scans will prevent, present more useful information. The image on the right shows four panels from a CT scan that clearly shows a nasal labial cyst found on the patient's right inferior nasal region. On histological examination, nasal labial cysts will be lined with pseudostratified non-ciliated columnar epithelium with goblet cells present. 
A treatment option for nasal palatine duct cysts most commonly includes surgical excision and curatage. Care must be taken, however, as failure to fully excise the lesion can lead to infection with possible perforation and fistula formation into the oral cavity. As an alternative, large lesions may require marsupialization, which will reduce the size of the cyst for subsequent enucleation. Even after surgical treatment, these lesions can have a 2 to 11% recurrence rate, indicating follow up on future appointments. Further complications of treatment may include damage to the nasal floor, creation of an oral nasal communication by perforation, fistula formation, or damage to teeth found within the vicinity of the cyst. Here is a post op picture of the anterior maxillary palate that shows the excision of a nasal palatine duct cyst. A definitive diagnosis was made through radiographic interpretation, which involved a round radiolucency greater than 6 millimeters between tooth number 8 and 9. As we discussed, the nasal palatine duct cyst is not a very common cyst, and it rarely occurs with pain and swelling, but they can be present. The nasal palatine duct cyst can cause some structural displacement if it is allowed to get large enough and a differential diagnosis for an NDC includes enlarged incisive canals, radicular cysts, and a nasal labial cyst. Here are our reference image and citations. Thank you for watching our presentation.